back in 1938 I was in junior college and at that point I learned about a program called CPTC that the government was starting which was an acronym for the Civilian Pilot Training Corps where they were getting more pilots trained knowing full well that eventually they would need them if in fact we ever went to war. At that time, <clears throat> 20 of us at the St. Joseph uh, College were selected to go out to Rosecrans Field and fly Piper Cubs to get our private pilot's license. We went through ground training at the college and then went out to the airport to learn about the Piper Cub, which was a small single engine airplane, which was easy to fly and which was provided by the government. At that time, there was a bad winter in Missouri and it snowed all the time, so the airplanes were all equipped with skis. It was cold, so after we got through flying, we always drained the oil out of the engines and put it on the stove to keep it warm so the next day when we came out we could put warm oil into the engines because it was always difficult to keep the engines going in that extremely cold weather. I can remember many times when we go up to practice stalls or spins and back in those days it was mandatory that you could do a precision two turn spin in each direction coming out within 10 degrees of where you started in order to pass your tests. Many times in that spin or in doing stalls the prop would come dead still to stop because the engine wouldn't run which meant that we had to dive it down to get enough speed to get the prop to turning again so that the engine would start. This wasn't particularly scary, but uh, after you did it a few times, but it was very interesting to have to do that. Anyway, I went through all that training and finally got a private pilot's license without her ever having landed on wheels because the skis were the only way that we had to land. This was scary because there were no brakes on skis and several of the airplanes went sliding into the hangars and other things damaging the airplanes. Fortunately this never happened to me because if a crosswind got you it was very dangerous and you couldn't uh, do much about keeping it going straight. However, it was a sporty course and I graduated and got my private pilot's license. I guess that was in 1939. At that time, I could see war clouds forming and I figured we'd probably go to war eventually and figure I might be drafted anyway. So I got three years of college and then decided to get into the flying cadet program of the Air Force. So I signed up at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas and they accepted me and then in June of 1940 I went to Tulsa, Oklahoma to the Spartan School of Aeronautics where I flew a PT-19 which was a low wing plane made by Ryan, which was also fairly easy to fly. The hazing there was terrible, 
with the upperclassmen waking you up in the middle of the night and were making you go through all a lot of silly things but it was probably good for discipline as far as the flying was concerned it was easy because I had a private pilot's license already and I was almost as good a pilot as my instructor who won lots of bets on me or they string a line across the field and the pilot then we were all supposed to come in and land right on top of that white line and I did this many times knowing how to maneuver the airplane with slips and skids and so forth to land it exactly where I wanted to so my instructor was very happy with me because he many made many bets and money and cigarettes on my ability as a pilot from this primary training then I went to Randolph Air Force Base in San Antonio, Texas where I flew a basic trainer and uh, after I passed my 40 hour check there that was an indication I would be commissioned as a second lieutenant and so I was able to go out and buy myself my first new 1940 Buick automobile a beautiful streamlined uh, a Buick with dual carburetors which they never could make work very well and which they finally uh, blocked off one of the carburetors even so it was a fast car streamlined and a nice car to own I bought that first car for nine hundred and eighty five dollars with everything on it at that time including a spotlight which I used while hunting at, after dark at that time also we were able to buy uh, guns through the military at a cheap rate and I got a little 22 automatic pistol which was great for shooting uh, rabbits and things like that that uh, we were able to uh, uh, do at night or any time we wanted to can see them from Randolph Air Force Base then I went to Kelly Air Force Base to take advanced training and there graduated on February the 7th 1941 as a brand new second lieutenant in the Army Air Corps before that time I was a flying cadet after that I was a second lieutenant in the army and as such wore a brown belt Sam Brown belt they called it why I'll never know except for the fact they said that I had to have it so I could handle it would handle my sword I'm not sure why I was supposed to have a sword because obviously I couldn't take it on an airplane with me because instead when we were flying in combat we always had a 45 in a shoulder holster but we didn't become an Air Force the United States Air Force until after the war in 1947 in the meantime we were all a part of the Army Air Corps I was flying BT-13s made by Vol-T and at first I was stationed at Randolph as a instructor but very quickly they had opened up a new field up at San Angelo Texas called Goodfellow and there about uh, uh, 50 of us went up there to a muddy field because they just opened it up no runways and few airplanes waiting our first class to come in which was 41A and that was early in 1941 at that time I was an instructor flying four hours a day 
an hour apiece with uh, cadets and over a period of three and a half years when I was there instructed many people in learning to fly incidentally and Washi got a few who were dangerous it was nice though because we had back in those days had complete liberty to take an airplane on weekends and fly anywhere in the country that we wanted to provided we got back in time to fly with our cadets if we were scheduled on a Monday morning. As a result, being single, I flew all around the country and had a map on the wall pinpointing all the many, air, many airports where I'd landed. Many times a group of us went together and we practiced formation flying or dangerously we would fly under bridges or chase uh, railroad cars having the uh, conductor get up on top of the train and waving to us as we went by. In order to get new airplanes, which they needed all the time, additional airplanes, we made several trips out to California to the Volte factory to pick up new airplanes to fly them back. And from San Angelo, Texas, we'd go up to Big Springs to get on a plane, a commercial plane, to go to California. And always had to take our own parachutes along because they didn't have parachutes out there. Needless to say, the people were very apprehensive about the fact that here was a lot of pilots getting on an airplane with parachutes, not knowing where they thought they might be crashing or whether we were going to practice jumping or what. But anyway, that wasn't the case. And when we got out to California then, we were usually royally entertained by Hollywood celebrities like Bill Holden, who took a pride in taking us to various places, buying us dinner with a lot of the hopeful Hollywood starlets that went along to keep us company. Very entertaining but I won't put the details into this uh, panegyric. Anyway, usually when we left the Volte factory, we would always fly up to, San, uh, to Las Vegas to spend a night there. But we were allowed a certain time for rest and relaxation. And we had a wonderful time up in Las Vegas seeing the shows and doing a little gambling perhaps going to Boulder Dam. Then the next morning when we take off, on both occasions when I went out, we always flew down through the Grand Canyon for at least a hundred miles. And always down below the rim of the canyon where you could actually look up and see the people and wave to them who we were looking down and seeing us flying down below them through the canyon. It was interesting going down the canyon and twisting and turning and uh, no problem at all for a long ways until we got down uh, maybe a hundred miles, something like that, and then climb up to a reasonable altitude and go on into Amarillo or someplace like that to get more gas before we went on into San Angelo. I went on two trips like that and enjoyed both of them very much. even though I loved to fly the B-17. It was another Boeing airplane, very easy to fly, very forgiving, and uh, I had a very interesting experience in flying it in Grand Island. Uh, I had a, my Buick that I had originally bought, I had taken it to Grand Island and one night we were all out to our usual place where we went to have drinks and dinner and I took a bunch of my boys back to base 
and but I couldn't put them all in the car at one time. I'd come back and get another load. When I came back, I foolishly left the keys in my car when I went in to get them, and somebody stole the car. I need to say, I reported it to the police, and they assured me that they would look around and try to find it. Well, they didn't. So one day I got the brilliant idea that I would get the, a B-17 there on the base, tell them I want to go out on a low altitude uh, navigation mission. Okay, so I told my gunners and all, well, we're going out and we're going to look for my car. So at about 300 feet we flew up and down over every street in Grand Island. Nebraska looking for my car and we couldn't find it and uh, then going back I flew over the police station and looked down and there it was in the parking lot of the police station went back to base landed went back to the police station went in to see the sergeant I says how you doing to find my car? Oh, we're looking for it. We're just looking so hard. We haven't found it yet. I said, well, have you looked in your own parking lot? Well, of course. I said, come with me, please. He went out the parking lot. I said, there's my car parking out here in your parking lot. He was so embarrassed. He couldn't believe it. Well, I don't know how we missed that. I said, well, I don't know how you did either, but give me the keys let me get it out of here because I was getting ready to go overseas at that time and we only had another week or so and I wanted to sell it before I left because I couldn't take it with me and we were getting ready to leave anyway I got my car back and eventually then we packed up all our stuff and went to Kearney Nebraska to get all of our some of the stuff we needed and then flew to Sacramento California where we loaded up all the stuff we needed for our overseas trip. After I was at San Angelo for uh, many years, I'll never forget the morning on December the 7th, I was in operations ready to fly to St. Joe, Missouri to see my parents, which I did frequently, when I heard about Pearl Harbor. I then asked the operations officer if I could go. He says, sure. He says, I don't think the Japs going to be bombing us here today. So I took off and sure enough there wasn't any problem. But it was interesting that here I was, a brand new second lieutenant, and I had figured maybe that uh, we might get into war, but I didn't think it would be the Japanese. That was a big surprise. But on the way down, down or way to St. Joe, I remember specifically chasing some railroad cars, and I never was over 500 feet all the way up to Oklahoma City, where I refueled for gas, and then went on up to St. Joe to land there. On many occasions we would fly over to some of the cities along the border and go across into Mexico to get rum, which was cheap, and also get some good quail dinners, which were wonderful. Remember one time I took uh, nine of my, uh, or eight others, but so nine of us airplanes we went into El Paso Big Springs went across the border and went into this my one of my favorite bars there and uh, uh, asked the bartender whose name was cue ball bald-headed obviously to give everybody a glass of Baratiaga which is a fermented cactus juice which I had before very good with a ginger ale chaser he gave us all one that was nine of them 
They wanted to know if we wanted to have a second round. I said, sure. So we all had a second round. Then I asked him, how much do you want? And I gave him two dollars. He was happy for everything. <laughs> About ten cents a drink. Anyway, another time, I took 21 airplanes from my outfit up to St. Joseph, Missouri again to uh, on a training mission. The weather was lousy, but we I was the leader and they flew in formation with me after we got up around Kansas City and we went roaring over St. Joe, all 21 airplanes in formation, rattling the windows and the uh, china and the kitchens and all before we landed in St. Joe. We spent the night there and then the next morning as planned we were ready to take off. One of the airplanes wouldn't start. Each of our airplanes we had a crew chief or enlisted man along with us. We always made it a point to take them along because in the Air Force we always had a great camaraderie with our enlisted people. We lived with them. It wasn't like in the other services where they were aloof and kept apart, but in the Air Force those men were the ones, the mechanics in particular, that were taking care of your airplanes and you depended upon them to uh, be your livelihood and not to crash. Anyway, one of the airplanes wouldn't start and we didn't want to go without it because we had planned a formation flight over the city with a V for victory and uh, as you know the V is dit 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 da so we had three airplanes for the dits and then three airplanes flying alongside for the dash and then all the air other airplanes were flying in a V formation behind that. Anyway, this old crew chief says, well, maybe I can get the thing started, Captain. He said, uh, let's see if I can take a rope and tie it around the propeller hub and we'll get a whole bunch of us and we'll pull in that thing real hard and see if we can't get it started. If you'll get in there on the wobble pump and turn the ignition on. Lo and behold, he tried it and I got the airplane started. It wasn't my airplane, but then I turned it over to the regular pilot and told him when we got to the Oklahoma City just not to shut it off because he might not get it started again or he might spend the night there. So when he got to Oklahoma City he did exactly that against rules and regulations, but he had no choice where he got gas and then he took on uh, off for San Angelo. All of us got back safely. We flew over St. Joe with our V for victory formation beautifully. Newspapers took pictures of it and published it in the St. Joe Gazette and everybody was uh, happy and uh, it was a good trip all the way and we, everybody had a good time uh, practicing formation flying and navigating and so it was an educational trip as well as fun. Uh, after I'd, I had been at St. Jo or at uh, Goodfellow Field for about three and a half years, unexpectedly I got orders to go to Fort Worth, Texas and that was about a month I didn't like the B-24, it wasn't a good airplane at all in my opinion and I still don't like it, but it more B-24s were made than anything else and they did serve well in both theaters, both European and Pacific. However, a lot of them were shot down, a lot were lost, a lot of them from mechanical errors and their problems. But anyway, after that then I was assigned to go to Fairmont, Nebraska to go into a B-29 outfit. When I got to Fairmont though, I found out that was a part of the 509th 
from which the Enola Gay uh, eventually uh, came. But they told me when I got there that I would probably get very little flying time because there were, weren't that many people going to be trained for that particular mission. I didn't like that idea at all, so I asked for a transfer and was transferred then to Grand Island, Nebraska, where I became a lead crew with all of my flying time and the fact that I had been a head of the instrument department flying uh, on instruments at Goodfellow and head of the link trainer department. They made me the aircraft commander and which I was able to pick then all of the other members of the crew except for the co-pilot who was assigned to me. But I picked the bombardier, navigator, uh, radar operator, and so forth. There was 11 men on the B-29 and uh, that would include the pilot, co-pilot, the bombardier, the engineer, radio operator, navigator, central fire control, two gunners, radar operator, and a tail gunner. And uh, my crew was uh, uh, specially trained and on many missions and everybody else would fly along in formation with us and when my bombardier dropped the bombs, all the other bombardiers would drop their bombs at the same time, not even using their bomb sites. On a lot of missions, however, we didn't always go in formation, so each bombardier had to be specially trained so he could do that himself, or in case of inclement weather, the radar operator would give instructions on how to do this. Uh, actually, the bombardier on a bomb run was in complete control of the airplane for about two minutes. And the pilot then, it was on autopilot, and the bombardier could change the airplane's direction, altitude, speed, or anything he wanted to, so he get his bombs on the target. He would open the bomb bay doors when he wanted to, and at that point, of course, he couldn't fire the gun up in front. And that fell upon me, let's say, as a pilot to operate the gun, at which many times I sat there and with nothing else to do except fire at zeros that might be coming in. And on several occasions I noticed when these zeros would come in shooting at us, they would fly upside down because their bottom of their zeros were armor plated and when every fifth bullet we fired was a tracer, I could actually physically see the tracers bouncing off of the bottom of the airplane. However, obviously all of them didn't hit the armor plate, a lot of them went into the airplane, and therefore we were able to shoot down an undetermined number of zeros, because with that many airplane many guns, let's say, in each airplane shooting, no one was ever sure who shot down on an airplane. However, on those cases where we're flying alone singly, and we shot down one, and it's recorded by a gun camera, then at least we could paint a zero on the airplane to show that we had not only had a mission there and dropped bombs, but also we had destroyed a certain number of enemy airplanes. me flying my B-29. You notice the throat mic, which we all use at that time, as well as a headset. And all I had to do was to press a button on my control column of the airplane to transmit information. We did not wear a parachute or a flak suit 
until we got over the target. Here's a picture of some of our airplanes flying in formation with a circle R on the tail, which was our group insignia. Here's a picture of several B-29s flying over Mount Fujiyama in Japan, which was one of our landmarks that we used for getting together into formations if we flew individually. When we left Grand Island to go overseas, we stopped at Kearney, Nebraska to pick up a lot of our supplies, but not all of them. But that's a place where we picked up our new airplanes. In fact, we went over to Kearney by car. And from there, we went to Sacramento, California and picked up all of our special gear that we needed and headed off then for Hawaii. From then, we stopped at Wake and Kwajalein and on into Tinian, landing there on New Year's Day. The squadron commander, John Osborne, rode with my crew, and when we arrived, the executive officer was there meeting us. And we were certainly glad to be there in that desolate country. The runways were over 6,000 foot long and uh, made of coral. The sea bees had come in and just scraped off a lot of the topsoil and got down to the coral where they could then make a very nice flat runway. And there were four of them parallel. There were a few trees on the island. The sea bees had sprayed the island with DDT and other things. There wasn't any mosquitoes, no flies, no birds. The only thing was on the island that was living basically were these little green lizards that evidently they weren't killed. As a result, when I planted some flowers there in front of my tent and we moved into a great big 22 men tents we would hold two crews in which I put a sign saying the Hotel Rubidoux which is the name of the hotel in St. Joe, Missouri. Also there's a picture of the latrine that we used with the jeep parked in front of it. Here's a picture of my personal Jeep that I had when I was a squadron operations officer. I had a man in the organization that used to take care of or remodel old airplane or old cars back home. So he asked me one day if he could take my Jeep and spread a couple of uh, drop tanks and put those on for fenders and paint it blue and do a lot of other things to it. It looked beautiful. One of the group commander didn't like it at all and gave me 24 hours to get it back into GI condition. While on Tinian, we couldn't help but notice when we took off sometimes, we looked down and there was a special compound with a B-29 down there. We could tell it was a different B-29, it didn't have guns on it, and it was highly guarded, we couldn't get close to it, but we could see it from the air when we took off. 
However, it was pretty well camouflaged too, so you couldn't see much. Eventually, this proved to be the Enola Gay and the other airplanes, the boxcar and so forth, that were assigned to the 509th outfit. Eventually then, when the atomic bomb was dropped, the Enola Gay, piloted by Colonel Paul Tibbets, instead of their lance that they had on the tail, they decided to put our Circle R on the tail, which was a six bomb group insignia, so that in case any Jap fighters come up to take a look, which they didn't, at the end of the war, that they would think it was just a weather reconnaissance airplane and pay no attention to it. But right today in the museum at Dulles Airport in Washington DC, the Enola Gay sits there in all of its splendor with a circle R on the tail showing that it was our sixth bomb group airplane. Well anyway, our weather in Grand Island was very bad in the winter time. Lots of sleet and ice and we had trouble of, of flying. So the commanding officer, the group commanding officer decided we'd all go down to Puerto Rico to train. Which was wonderful. The weather was good. We went down to Brinkin Air Force Base there. But it was about to be closed so but we could we would do all of our flying down there without any problems at all and sit down on the big patio in the evenings and drink frozen daiquiris for 10 cents a piece and all that sort of stuff and they were ready to close the base you're getting ready to anyway and the liquor store was going to close so all the crew decided we'd pool our money and we buy up all this booze for roughly a dollar a bottle or ridiculously low prices and we bought about 40 cases of booze and stowed it in the airplane and then of all things the group commander decided he would ride back with us to Grand Island on a long range mission. Little did he know and he had, he had had a fit if he would known he was riding on all that booze but anyway, he didn't know. We got back to about Kansas City, I think it was. We called him to Grand Island. He said, well, the base is closed, bad weather. Go to Lincoln, Nebraska as an alternate. So we went there and I made an instrument approach on Lincoln, I told the co-pilot, put on the radar altimeter and let me know when it got to 250 feet and if we weren't out in the clear by 250 feet, it'd be a missed approach. We got down to 250 feet and we're still in the fog, so in the soup, so I put the power to it and we climbed on out. I knew already what I was going to do. I was going to St. Joe, Missouri and land there if the weather was any good. So we flew down there and I call, called in uh, to the tower and asked for the landing or what the weather was and it was fine, 800 broken, no problem. And uh, I asked if my old buddy was in the tower there who I'd known for years before and he was off that particular day. But they told him, said, well, I'm gonna bring a B-29 in. A B-29? <laughs> Boy, well, okay. So I landed at St. Joe and the uh, group commander said, well, why didn't you go into Kansas City? And I said, very simple, this is my hometown. Oh, okay. So then another pilot was flying behind us. So he called them on the radio and said, well, come on into St. Joe here, it's fine. So we had two B-29s on the ground. The next morning when I took off, 
I told my dad, who worked at an armory company, who was right down basically in the runway, about five miles down, to be out there and he'd see me take off. And I kept it about 200 feet all the way down there and went zooming across the armory company and wagged my wings to him, waved to him before we went back to Grand Island. But uh, that was a, a real nice trip and uh, but little did the Colonel know he was flying on 40 cases of booze which we took overseas with us incidentally and that helped us build the officers club there because I gave it the CBs. One night after a mission we were all asleep and somebody shook me on the shoulder and I looked up and the CB and says get your crew up. I said what for? He said, well he said we're gonna have a feast. A feast? Yeah. And well we hadn't had anything to eat in the way of fresh meat or anything. All we'd been eating is spam since, spam since we got there. The Navy had a lot of good meat and all that sort of stuff in their lockers, but we didn't have anything. So we got in this big truck he brought up and went down there and a mile away we could smell this barbecue. They had found a pig on the island somewhere and had butchered it and barbecued it and had man manufactured, these CBs could build anything, they'd manufactured the barbecue down there. and. We went down there and cut off big slabs of that meat and ate it like we were going, out of, going crazy. But they, the CBs eventually then built my little house when I became the squadron commander, the one that I showed you before with the parachutes up on the top as a ceiling. They built that for me. They, the construction battalion were a great bunch of, great, of people and uh, we got along real well. While on Tinian, <clears throat> we had no beer to drink at all. Uh, the, what little beer we got was a lousy beer. And so we did have a B-17 and a C-54, which we could use for special purposes. And on a couple occasions, some of the crews there, including me, would fly to Australia and load up with Foster's beer. Great beer made down there in Australia. Bring back many, many cases <laughs> that everybody enjoyed. While there we got a lot of other things too, but uh, Foster's beer was the main thing. One night, I remember on the on Tinian, the CBs were very friendly with us and we always made it a point when we were uh, going up on our test stop to call down and tell them to bring up uh, or to uh, bring up some people and we'd take them on a trip. Well, I mean, just flying around, you know, and they loved that. Uh, flying in a B-29 and uh, also we found that if they would save all their bottles, we asked them to bring up the bottles, they'd bring a whole dump truck full of bottles for that which they had, Cokes and so forth, which we did not have. And before we would go on a mission then, after we put the Bombay, <coughs> we'd close the Bombay doors and then shovel these bottles in on top of the Bombay doors. And the reason for that was that then when we got up to the target and we'd open up the bomb bays before dropping the bombs, all these bottles would go screaming out. And the Japs thought the bombs were coming because of the screaming, I mean the whistling noise. And they would hit the slip, tr slip trenches, we found out later off of, from intelligence, and would stop firing their guns, which is wonderful. Then the bombs came later. But we found that these, uh, all these various bottles that we put in there and then as soon as the Bombay doors opened, 
out they came. It worked out good. Uh, one of the first missions that went on, uh, anti-aircraft fire hit the airplane and uh, uh, down and injured three of my gunners. Uh, coming back then, I had to land at Iwo Jima, and we had only taken it over about two weeks prior to that time. The runway was potholed and was fairly short, but I got it down all right and got my uh, crewmen out and into the infirmary where they could be treated. After we patched up the airplane, uh, then we were able to take off and go back to Tinian. And I was never so happy to get away because the place had a horrible smell from the uh, dead bodies all over the place that had not been cleared out yet and all from the sulfur that was coming out of the ground. That was the first time I landed Iwo and I landed there a couple, a couple other times later on. Some other members of the squadron actually bailed out over uh, Iwo when the weather was bad and uh, uh, one of my friends, Harry George, landed in a uh, trench with some of the troops, in fact, with his parachute. Uh, and he saved that parachute and sent it back to the States to the gal that he finally married, and she made that canopy into a, a wedding dress. Uh, anyway, uh, the uh, Another crew uh, ditched out in the right off of the island, and uh, the airplane floated out there for so long that finally the Navy had to shoot it down so it would sink so that the Japs wouldn't get a hold of it. But the airplane did made a beautiful landing, and since it was pressurized, it floated for quite a while. The uh, that was one of the best things about the B-29 was it was pressurized. We could walk around inside there without an oxygen mask on uh, at any altitude. And of course the uh, guns were uh, all automatically controlled by a central fire control system with computers. So the gunners, all they had to do was to aim and uh, keep it on the target and pull the trigger and uh, they would fire and uh, he wasn't sure. no one was ever sure except the central fire control gunner as to which guns were firing but uh, it was a, a very uh, wonderful airplane and uh, I was fortunate to be in flying it instead of the V-24 We did a lot of our training missions on the islands close by, like Truck, which was down close to Guam, where we that was our bombing site where we bombed that island pretty good on practice missions before we went on our first mission. I had uh, 23 missions. Some of the most memorable ones was the 19th, I guess. Our first missions were at high altitude, like 29,000 feet as I recall in the first one, but the winds up there were so strong, like over 200 miles an hour, it was very difficult for the bombardier to not only make a good bomb run, but also to predict the, what the winds were, which would blow the bombs off course slightly. After we did that for a while. General LeMay decided we'd come down to lower altitudes and 
towards the end of the war then, at least by the 19th mission, we were down at 8,000 feet, and that's when they decided to firebomb Tokyo and burn it out, and other cities too. Main reason for that, of course, was to burn out all the utilities and the facilities there, because the Japanese were making a lot of the small items like coils and so forth in their homes. They had lathes and so forth in their homes, but their homes were all little shacks made of flammable material. So we dropped incendiary bombs to everywhere on there except around the Imperial Palace, which we were told not to drop on because they didn't want to kill the Emperor. So they had to have somebody at the end of the war to sign the peace treaty. But anyway, on the 19th mission, I was ready to go on this night bombing to take off at night and to bomb Tokyo at night. But my right engine wouldn't start. And the group commander said, well, if you can get off in an hour, you can go. Now, normally it would take about three hours to change a starter on a big engine like that, but <clears throat> my mechanics got to work on it and we'd get pretty close to the hour. They said they could do it and as they were buttoning up the cowling and all in the fourth engine, we started up the other three and we started to taxi out and I started up the four engine, fourth engine as we were going out and checked it out before we took off. They're running fine, so we got it started and were able to take off just before the hour was up. The main reason we were so anxious to go was because after 20 missions, we got to go to Hawaii for a week, actually 10 days for rest leave. And we were very anxious to do that. So we got up to Tokyo, or Japan in this case, about an hour late. Well, from a, about an hour out, we could see all the fires burning. It was a clear night. The bombardier then just dropped a bunch of bombs between lines of other bombs that had been already dropped. So he'd start new fires. After he dropped his bombs and closed the bomb bay doors, just as soon as he'd done that, we hit a therm the thermals from all the heat and the fires and it turned my airplane clear upside down. We had canteens and things all floating around the airplane, but I was on instruments, no big deal. Copilot helped me to roll the thing back up right. We lost, got down around about 4,000 feet. But we climbed on out of there, couldn't see anything because we were completely covered with all kinds of soot and oil and everything from those fires. and But we climbed on out. The airplane was not flying well. I could tell something was wrong, but just put it on autopilot because it was trying to turn to the right, as I recall. By the time we got to Iwo Jima, we had run into a couple of rainstorms and washed off enough of the uh, dirt and filth and all where I could see a little bit. We decided then we'd go on back to Tinian instead of stopping at Iwo. That was another four or five hours back. We got back to Iwo, I mean back to Tinian, and we got back there then we landed, went back to take a look at the airplane, and the whole vertical stabilizer had twisted from being upside down because the airplane was not stressed to be flown in that condition. But it was a sturdy airplane, dependable, but it never flew again because it was too too much damage to fix it. So they removed all the guns, the armament, the bomb site, and everything else of any value, and then did, uh, threw it off the cliff at the end of the runway into the ocean, and I got a new airplane. So that was a kind of a hairy experience, and for which the crew got a, 
I got a distinguished flying cross. Another memorable mission is when we were flying one time, bombing Japan, and anti-aircraft fire I had knocked out my number four engine, which is the one on the far right, and we had to feather it. And the engineer announced also that we were losing oil out of number three. Because the flak had damaged both those engines on that side. So we continued until the oil ran out, at which point we had to feather that one too because you wouldn't let it run because if it did it got too hot and sometimes the propeller would come off and might go into the airplane and knock the airplane down. So eventually we had to feather that engine too so I was flying on two engines out on one side which is very unusual and difficult. However, because as the airplane with two engines down on one side you get a lot of torque and it wants to turn to the right into the dead engines. However, we slowed down for two reasons. One, to stop the torque and two, to conserve a little fuel and also to make it easier to fly. But we put it on autopilot. I dropped down to about 500 feet above the ocean and flew back so that we had to parachute out or ditch we'd be down fairly close to where the submarines were or the other boats to pick us up. After many hours though, we finally got back to base, very low on fuel, and just hoping that none of the engine, other engines would go out, which unfortunately they didn't. I landed and uh, on two engines, and as we were taxiing back into the hard stand, one of the other engines died of fuel starvation, so I was taxiing on one engine. But that was enough to get back. So that was a pretty hairy mission, but we were lucky to get back, and uh, everybody on the crew did an outstanding job, and we made it, and uh, God was sitting on our shoulders. Here's a picture of the crew that I took with me on the most memorable flight that I had during the whole war. This was, here's Lucky. I'd been promoted to major and I was the uh, squadron commander. And I took a group of airplanes on the day the armistice was signed to China to deliver supplies to a prisoner of war camp in China. I didn't take my regular crew because I took a lot of other people who had never been on a mission and this was not a dangerous mission anyway. No firing of guns or anything because the war was over. But we went over to Saipan and loaded up both of our bomb bays with pallets. Each pallet had four parachutes of different colors on the sides of it, and there were two of them, one in each bomb bay. And in those pallets were all kinds of food, medicine, clothing, bicycles, sewing machines, everything that the prisoners of war we thought might need. This was a very long mission and we finally got to China at which point there was a big wall there and I took my whole squadron over at a very low altitude which scared a lot of the people who were up on the wall who jumped down into the river 
we came on around then after we located the camp which was marked by a great big stone white stone enclosure down there with PW on it we came around to make our run and individually dropped all of our pallets we made two runs because we dropped one bomb bay the first time and then another one the second time and what a sight it was to come around there and see all those colored parachutes a lot of them which were still floating down others are on the ground and all of the prisoners of war running around waving to us with their crutches up in the air some of them riding bicycles there wasn't a guard in sight not an car of any kind in sight just a lot of people jogging out from town because they were starving too and they shared in a lot of the supplies that we dropped but this was a special crew that only flew with me on that one mission unfortunately we had a little problem in dropping one of the pallets out of the bomb bay it damaged the doors and it wouldn't shut so we couldn't go all the way back to Tinian without stopping somewhere to get it repaired and get more gas so we stopped at Okinawa fortunately the Marines had already taken over at Okinawa some time before then and while it was kind of a hairy landing no big problem and we got the doors fixed and then flew on back to Tinian but that was a long mission I think as I recall around 18 hours of flying but it was the most memorable one later on a lot of the POWs were rescued brought back some of them came back to our base and we interviewed them to find out how much they liked everything and of course they liked the chocolate and the peaches and all the other things including the medicine and actually we dropped more stuff than they possibly could have used but they shared it with the natives there so everything worked out well but we had a lot of airplanes up here we dropped a lot of materials and that was on the day the armistice was assigned on the battleship Missouri where Douglas MacArthur accepted the surrender from the Japanese dignitaries Back to San Angelo, Texas, Goodfellow Field. While I was there, the base commander liked the fact that I wanted to do a lot of different things, not rather than just fly as an instructor. So he appointed me as an example as the head of the military police. And I rode around on motorcycles with the military police and went on chases with them around the base and inspected for security he also put me in charge of the WAC unit there was about a hundred females there on the base and that was a very interesting experience especially going through and doing the inspections and uh, uh, seeing all the stuff that they had in their lockers and so forth and see if they were properly taken care of the most interesting part of that was to hearing the stories about why they didn't get back to the base on Sunday night before curfew some of them were disciplined and some I just laughed so hard I didn't do anything very funny but I heard some weird stories also I wanted to be an instrument pilot so they sent me to school at Bryan Texas for a month and I became an instrument instructor as well came back to Goodfellow Field and took over the link trainer department as well as giving all the instructors on the base a, uh, a check to be sure that they knew how to fly instruments the base commander, Colonel DeVazier, 
uh, appreciated this. And when he had to go to Washington one time, since we didn't have any particular airplane for that purpose except our BTs, BT-13s, he had me flying to Washington. But when we got as far as Pittsburgh, the weather was icing, and I had no icing equipment on the BT-13. So I just told him I wasn't going to take a chance going in, and he flew in commercial. And so I spent the night at, uh, in Pittsburgh, and later that night I got a call from him in Washington said, do you want to go with me on this trip that I'm going on? It's about a two-week trip where we're going to take the Chilean chief of staff, head of the Chilean Air Force, all around the United States and Canada to uh, inspect to see airplanes that they might buy for Chile. I said, well, I don't have any clothes here or anything. He said, well, don't worry about it. I'll just call back to base and have them uh, pack up your bags, uh, B-4, and uh, bring them up to you, and they'll pick up the airplane here, and you just get on a commercial jet, fly on, or <laughs> no jets in those days, commercial plane, fly into Washington, and meet me, and then we'll head out from here, and we're going to Toronto, Canada first. I said, sure. So that was a very interesting two-week trip with him and the Chileans. And uh, there was a little young fellow, civilian along on the, with the Chileans as the advisor. His name was Underaga. It turned out he was the heir to the Underaga wine factory in Chile, which is a very famous wine distillery, now absorbed by somebody else, but for quite a while after that I got a lot of uh, wine sent to me, but uh, I'll never forget one time then, let's see, we went to up to Canada to fly the Mosquito a bomber, uh, and from there I went down to St. Louis to fly the airplane down there, a dive bomber which I flew, which was very interesting. It had special flaps on it to where you could point the nose right straight down and still wouldn't go down all that fast for dive bombing, which was never incorporated by the Air Force. After that, we went out to Almogordo, New Mexico, where they wanted to see some uh, flights out there. And while we were there, the Underaga came to me and says, is there any chance that we could go over to Mexico? And uh, I said, well, I guess so. And uh, anyway, I took the foreigners over to Mexico. When we got there, they said, well, what should we order? I said, well, why don't you just get a assortment of everything and try them out, the tacos and the enchilados and everything. And, that sounds good, and have a carta blanca beer, or, and that sounds good. They did that, and went back then to Big Air Force Base, and middle of the night all hell broke loose. Uh, they all had dysentery, and it didn't bother me a bit, but those foreigners weren't used to that kind of food, I guess. And uh, Anyway, we were on our road then to go out to Los Angeles, but we had to wait for a couple of days for their vowels to <laughs> quiet down because we didn't dare fly over the Rockies going out there in an unpressurized airplane. Anyway, we finally got to Los Angeles and we were supposed to meet Howard Hughes. And we went to Chase's restaurant to meet Howard. At uh, supposedly we were, we were there at 8 o'clock and Howard came in about 11.30, something like that, in a, in a uh, sweatshirt and, and uh, uh, tennis shoes without any uh, tops to them, and his toes sticking out, and meeting all these dignitaries. And uh, 
Anyway, they met Howard Hughes, and I met Howard Hughes for the first time, even though I saw him many times after that. He didn't make a very good impression. But anyway, uh, after that then, Colonel DeVazier and I went on back to Selfridge Air Force Base, which is in Michigan, and he asked me if I'd ever been to take some uh, uh, mineral baths. I says, no, I sure hadn't. So he took me to Mount Clemens, and we went into this little place that had all these tubs in there, all discolored. Looked terrible from all the minerals from this mineral water that came up from the ground there. Got in this lukewarm water, and after about 10 minutes laying in there, began to sweat profusely. Got out, they wrapped us in towels, and we laid down there in a in bed for a while, took a little nap, and, uh, and finally got into a, a dry sauna, and uh, finally ended up going out and getting something to drink and eat. Probably lost five pounds, I guess. That was quite an interesting exercise, getting that mineral bath. But anyway, at, uh, Colonel DeVazier was a good friend. He liked me and I liked him. And After the war, I found out that uh, he had, he was down at McDill Air Force Base and uh, he had told General Casada who was the head of the outfit down there that I was coming back and he thought I would make him a good aide. So I became General Casada's aide and as such uh, met him for breakfast. He was a bachelor as was I and we flew around the country together. I was his pilot and only he always flew basically but I, he had a special B-26 with special wing tanks, additional wing tanks in there so we could fly all the way from McDill Air Force Base to, to Riverside, California nonstop uh, because uh, well, we had the first P-80 outfit out there at Riverside and so we'd fly out there to see at that time the head of the uh, P-80 and that's where General Casado and I both got checked out in the P-80s in, original, in its original infancy and I'll never forget that first time when I took off in a, a jet I couldn't believe something was missing namely the noise so quiet took off and of course no torque either when you took off and uh, but it was a short trip because back in those days uh, the endurance uh, duration was not very long at March Air Force Base we landed in about 45 minutes I guess we didn't fly in formation and we were, took off individually and but it was an interesting trip which I really enjoyed Anyway, thanks to General, uh, Colonel DeVazier, I became Pete Casada's aide down there at McDill. And later on, we were transferred to Langley Air Force Base uh, up in, La at, uh, in Virginia, right outside of Norfolk. I know, remember, I drove his 12 cylinder Lincoln up there uh, for him. And uh, he had the big uh, quarters on the base and uh, uh, I was living in the BOQ which was a miserable place and we often had lunch together. I always had breakfast with him, went to his place and had breakfast with him every morning and then went to uh, his office and then decide what I wanted to do and if I wanted to, I could fly his P-51, which I did several times. He had a special P-51 as well as the B-26. 
or go out to the golf course, play golf, or do errands for him, or do whatever he wanted me to do. And uh, but it was, uh, uh, or go to the commissary and pick up things. Uh, many times we get things. Uh, but, uh, on weekends he would fly to Bar Harbor, Maine, to see his the girl that he finally married, Kate Davis Pulitzer, and. Whenever I got to B-26 then, afterwards I could take off, say from a Thursday or whenever we flew up there and come back and pick him up whenever he wanted me to and I'd go to Omaha, Nebraska or, or Los Angeles or anywhere I wanted to in that B-26. So I flew all around in that beautiful fast airplane and uh, it was a wonderful experience. I found out later on that uh, I could go back to school. I'd only had three years of college and had an associate degree. And I figured to get ahead in the Air Force, I should get a baccalaureate at least. And at that time, the Air Force had a, sent a lot of people back to school to increase their education. And I was able to pick the University of Texas where I wanted to go back. I'd spent all the time in Texas and loved the people down there, loved the climate and everything else. And they had a good school at Austin, Texas for physics, which I wanted to uh, get degree in. So I was sent down to uh, Texas. I told General Casada that I wanted to go back to school. He thought that was a great idea. And he says, well, we got a base down there at Austin. We got Bergstrom Air Force Base. Set up my airplane, I'll fly you down there and we'll set you up. And sure enough, we got in the airplane and flew to Bergstrom Air Force Base. We got down there and the base commander, whatever he is, he says, Jack's coming down here to go to school and I want you to set him up in the BOQ where he's, he can live here nicely next to the officer's club. But he's going to school here and it was all set up perfectly. Going back to Langley Air Force Base though, at one time when the General and I were going out for lunch, I said, General, would you take a few minutes and come down here and see where I'm living? Well, sure. We went down there and I showed him where I was living in this place where I had uh, just uh, two big rooms basically. One was my bedroom and the other was where I was studying and all. And he said, where's the toilet? I said, down the hall. And, uh, and I said, well, he said, no kitchen? I said, I eat the officer's club. And I said, there's something uh, very wrong about this, General. I said, uh, here, if I was a married man, I would live on the base where you live, and I'd have a two or three story, or four, I mean, two story, three or four bedroom house, brick house, beautiful, two or three bathrooms and all. Now here I'm a bachelor like you are, but I'm being uh, taken advantage of, I think. I'm not getting the same thing. He said, well, what do you think we should do? I said, well, why don't you be a hero to all of the single men in the Air Force and let them give them a chance, an opportunity to live off base and have the government pay them a ration, just like they would for, if they didn't have a house for a married pe people to live on the base, they would give them a quarter, give them a ration to go out and rent a house off off base. I says there's no reason just because a man's single that he ought to be taken advantage of like that. He said, I think you're right. So he went back to Washington, came back, called me in his office, he says, I've got good news for you. He said, I got permission from the chief of staff to let my bachelor officers then live off base I said, well, would you do me a favor, General? He said, what's that? I said, don't announce this until Monday. He says, why? I said, because I want to go out and get the biggest, best room that I can find before everybody else hears about this. He says, smart thinking. So I went down to the biggest hotel in town there on the beach by Norfolk, and I told him I wanted to rent a two-suite bedroom place, 
And they said, well, up on the second floor, we got a beautiful one with a great big patio out looking over the swimming pool and looking out over the bay where the carriers are and all. And that's available. I said, I'll take it. And uh, so I got another friend of mine who was a lieutenant colonel in charge of intelligence. And we moved into there. And we could go out there on our patio and look down on the swimming pool. Some pretty girls down there, we would hold up our drink and say, come on up. And very shortly there'd be a, several of them up there. We met more nice girls that way and there was always a big dance there twice a week. And uh, and living in that hotel was just wonderful. And uh, But uh, when I got down to uh, Texas, it wasn't all that good. But it was still livable. But fortunately, they decided to tear down the BOQ, and so I got a permission to be able to live off base anyway, and got a nice apartment there, up closer to the university. But General Casada and I were remained to be friends many years, and even after I got through with, at the University of Texas, and I went back to Washington, and he was heading up the Lafont Plaza big hotel complex and I was working there close by and used to see him have drinks with him in the evening and all until he died. He married Kate Davis Pulitzer though and they lived in their big house there at Langley and it was right on the water and he had a yacht that went with it along with the staff and General LeMay and his wife used to come down frequently and other generals I was always invited to go along with them, which I did, and had a lot of fun and uh, uh, doing that. At the University of Texas, I studied physics. I was only sent there for a two-year uh, program, but I worked hard, sometimes taking as many as 21 hours. And uh, some of which were courses that I didn't need to take, but I wanted to take, like geology. I was extremely interested in geology because flying across the country it was interesting to be able to look down and see anticlines and synclines and fault lines and and there was an enormous fault right outside of Austin, Texas there. So I wanted to learn more about geology and I found that it was very interesting as I flew around the country seeing various things and uh, but that was an interesting course and I uh, graduated uh, I got my first degree, but while I was in that f two years, I had worked harder, and I got a second degree as well. I got a bachelor's in uh, physics, and also a bachelor's in math. So I wrote back to Washington and says, look, let me stay here another year, and I can get a master's degree. And they thought that was a good idea, so they let me stay an additional year. And I got ended up then with three degrees, including my master's in nuclear physics. Well, this obviously helped me then when I got out of school. And they immediately sent me back to Washington. And I got into research and development. While I was at the University of Texas, as my master's thesis, I decided I would write on something that had to do with a Navy Talos missile, which was a uh, missile that was in competition with some of our Air Force missiles. So I wrote a thesis, and it was uh, in a classified installation but I had my security clearance, there was no problem. I had complete access to it. Go in there and work all night if I wanted to or any time I could or wanted to on my, with my equipment and all. 
and I got very uh, familiar with some of the people working on the missile program and one day they asked me aren't you a pilot and I said sure well we need to be able to track some airplanes is there a chance you could get an airplane I said well of course I fly every month I've got to get four hours anyway I said, you want a big airplane, a small airplane, or what? What would like to start a big one? I said, oh, sure. I checked out in a C-47, or really a C-46. They had C-46s, which is a little bit bigger than a C-47 out of Bergstrom. So I could go out there about any time I wanted to and get a C-46. So we started out. Originally, I said, okay, I'll, on a certain day, I'll be at 2 o'clock. I'll come in from the east at 2,000 feet. Okay, fine. So they'd get their interferometer system out, which is a part of the Talos missile, and track me coming in, you know, and I'd go out, fly around, come in a different way, you know, and they could, okay, fine. And then the next day I'd say, well, okay, I'm coming in now at a different altitude. I'll come in at 8,000 feet. Okay. And I said, but I'm not going to tell you what direction I'm coming from. Okay. So I come in from a different altitude and direction and all, and uh, and they track me and so forth. And uh, they thought that was just great. And uh, I was happy to do it because I was getting my flying time in too. And and uh, then one day a buddy of mine came in and his T-33 and. Uh, landed Austin and at Bergstrom and I said well can I use your T-Bird this afternoon? Sure, do anything you want to. So I called the people at uh, the lab and said well I'm flying this afternoon you want to try to find me? Yeah. Okay, I said I'm not going to tell you what altitude or what direction or anything else. See if you can find me. Okay, I said but it'll be it. I forgot what time it was, it didn't matter. So I went up to about 25,000 feet in this T-Bird. And it was a small airplane, of course. And I was looking down there, and I could see them down there, and they couldn't find me, though. And they said, well, you're not there. I said, well, I can see you. Somebody just came out of the tunnel onto the roof. Yeah, you're right. Well, I says, I'm up here. Keep looking. Well, we can't find you. I said, well, give us a clue. Where are you? Well, I says, right now I'm about five miles, whatever it was, away from the base, or uh, from the lab, and I'm at 25,000 feet. Oh! Well, they finally found me. But uh, I says, well, that system isn't very good, is it? <laughs> but anyway, so... That was one of the things that I did while I was there working on my master's degree and uh, uh, they approved my thesis needless to say and then when I went back to Washington afterwards I was in research and development and General Yates there found out that I knew all about the Talos missile when we went down to talk to, to the board they were amazed I knew more about the Talos missile than the Navy people did basically and uh, we really put them on the defensive and uh, they didn't like that worth a hoot but uh, Jim Yates loved, loved the fact that I went along with him and would help him out on that but as a result of that research development then I went out to uh, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base and stayed out there for seven and a half years and I was the project officer then on the air-to-air -air missile made by a Hughes called Falcon. The air to air missile then let me go out to Alamogordo, New Mexico where they were flying the missiles and I was able to fly some of the jets out there and even went supersonic and uh, being able to uh, justify flying these things and flying the shooting the missiles against targets. It was a very interesting experience. At, while I was at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, I was a project officer for the Bomark missile, which was a 
combination of Boeing and the Michigan Aeronautical Research Center. This was a surface-to-air missile that had a, seat, a radar seeker that would look down towards the ground where you would get ground clutter. Very sophisticated. It uh, proved to be uh, pretty good, but never went into operation. And it was, uh, but uh, it was a very interesting experience because I was flying back and forth to Seattle at least once a month too. And I was one of the few people, I guess, got to flying on the Boeing Strata Cruiser. It was nice to climb up in a bunk in those things and fly clear across country and propeller airplane back in those days wasn't going that fast, but or not not nearly as fast as jet anyway. And it was nice five or six hours of sleep anyway. And that uh, Strata Cruiser, one of which is in the Smithsonian there in in Washington brings back very nostalgic, fond memories of trips I made on that trip. While in the Pentagon, working in research and development, I was a single officer, and out of the blue, one day I got a call they wanted me to report to the White House to report to General Landry over there. So I went over and he said, well, you've been selected along with six other Air Force officers to be White House aides to Harry Truman, if you would like to be. He said, you'll have to buy your own tuxedos and tails, but we got a good deal for you where it won't cost you a lot of money. And your job will be to come over and help on all parties. And whenever they was having a party, they would call me and I could had to drop what I was doing and go to the White House. Well, my bosses in the Pentagon didn't understand this and didn't like it much, but there wasn't much they could do about it. And I used that on several times as excuses to get out of the office anyway. But anyway, these were wonderful parties. We'd go over there and maybe be state dinners and uh, uh, let's say in the winter time we'd help the people, all the guests, take off their clothes, I mean their, not their clothes, their coats, and get them drinks and uh, and uh, do whatever we could to make them happy and uh, then uh, after they all went in for their state dinner we would have a, we had a private room down below with liquor and there and hors d'oeuvres and all that where we sat and waited until the state dinner was over and we helped all the people leave again and invariably Margaret Truman would come down and join us we tried to get her to sing for us, but she'd say, no, I can't sing. I only do that to please Dad. I, I danced with her several times, and uh, she was a good dancer. Uh, nobody at that time dated Margaret. Actually, we were forbidden to date her. Not that anybody wanted to anyway, because that was the rules. Later, they changed the rules when Lyndon Johnson went to the White House because his daughters wanted to date those single aides, and you had to be single to be a, an aide. And uh, and in fact, uh, one of the of Lyndon's daughters married one of the boys there, who finally became a senator. In fact, and uh, but we were on a blue list, you might say. There's a book they put out, and. Gwen Kafritz and all the other socialites there just about uh, uh, used that all the time to invite us to all various parties and at Christmas time there's at least three parties you could go to every night if you wanted to. Congressmen and senators used that too on many occasions. I got calls from some congressman's office saying are you available to take one of the Congressman's constituents' daughters out to see the sound, town tonight, and we'd all invariably say, "Well, 
I'd love to, but unfortunately, uh, I'm a little short of money right now. Oh, no problem. When she picks you up, she'll hand her an envelope for you. And uh, invariably, it'd be a couple hundred dollars in there, and uh, I show the gal at Georgetown and wherever she wanted to go, and and uh, it was it was a nice way to have fun. Uh, had to be on defensive on many kind, many occasions though, because I'd be very careful not to be accused of anything bad. And, I wouldn't have touched any of those girls for anything, but uh, we were invited to a lot of parties. We went out on the Sequoia, which was a, a, a Truman's yacht, you might say, where Lauren Bacall sat upon his piano and, and sang for him while he played it. This grand piano was bolted down to the floor of the Sequoia so it wouldn't roll around in rough water. And uh, on several occasions I went down in the mornings. Harry walked every morning. Lots of times I went down there and parked my car across the street from the Blair House because he lived in the Blair House because at that time the White House was being under renovation. They had parties there but he didn't live there. But uh, and I'd walk up and down Pennsylvania Avenue with him and he walked very fast always had a hat on double breasted coat and carried a cane and uh, just for decoration more than else because he wasn't crippled and, but he walked pretty fast and I know always there'd be a bunch of uh, reporters along to ask him questions and all I know one time we were going along and this big fat boy all was asking him questions and walking backwards and finally Harry just stopped and said, you go sit down on the curb over there, we'll pick you up on the way back. I'm afraid you're going to have a heart attack, you're all red in the face. And sure enough, we walked on down and to the treasury or further and came back and he went back in the Blair house, which incidentally is where some foreigners tried to assassinate him one time, unsuccessfully, fortunately. I remember one time when I, or every Christmas, the aides always went through the receiving line, as a lot of people did. All the White House staff was there, and you'd go through it and meet the chef, let's say, and everybody, including the end of it there would be Bess and Harry and uh, first time I went through there I was amazed when the president says well Jack it's good to see you I'm flying out to Kansas City here next Saturday for for Christmas uh, why don't you fly along with me and I'll get you a staff car and you can go up to St. Joe and uh, stay a couple days and then come back and fly back with me which I did and uh, here Harry Truman had figured on his own that I was from Missouri, he was from Missouri, Independence, and I was very flattered by that. As a result of that, he uh, re took a liking to me and uh, appreciated me coming down and walking with him on, in the mornings up and down Pennsylvania Avenue. And we had a big party then in, in the spring to repay our debts to all the socialites and all. And I remember we were at a big party at Anderson House one time. And my wife to be at that time invited her mom and dad to come up. And I told them both to bring their uh, nice clothes because we're gonna take them to the party and they'd probably meet the president. And so, they got to the party and uh, I knew exactly where the president was going to be and when he was going to enter and from what door and so forth. Anyway, Gene's mom kept hitting me in the ribs and said, well, when am I going to meet the president? I said, just relax, you're, you're dead pretty soon. And uh, 
So uh, I was watching my watch, and after we were having wine and hors d'oeuvres and all that, and I said, well, let's go over here by this uh, door over here for a minute. But I knew that Harry was going to walk down there in just about two minutes. And uh, sure enough, he came out. And, well, hello, Jack. How are you, Mr. President? I want to meet my I want you to meet my future wife here and my mother-in-law and father-in-law. And Louise couldn't even say her name. She was a flabbergasted. Just mumbled and. <laughs> was embarrassed afterwards to hear the president shaking her hand and she couldn't even say my name is Louise. And uh, she never for, never forgot that until the day she died or I wouldn't let her forget it. But uh, he was that kind of a man and uh, he, uh, I don't know how he got along with Bess because uh, nobody could. Uh, in fact, she uh, told him if he ran for president again, well, she was going back to Mama and the Independence and live back there, and uh, she wasn't going to be in Washington. Didn't like Washington, never had, and wasn't going to, wasn't going to stay there. And uh, so the president then very decided anyway he wasn't even going to run, so he didn't run. And he probably would have lost anyway because uh, with, with Ike running against him or whoever it was, <laughs> He probably wouldn't have won, but uh, so he left and got in his car of all things, he and his wife, and drove to Missouri from Washington without any Secret Service or anything else. As I retain, at that back in those days, I think he got a thirteen thousand dollar retirement every year of the President of the United States. All of which has changed now completely. Congress was so unhappy when I heard about it. They finally gave him $25,000 to pay for his postage and all. Now everybody that retires as a president is a multimillionaire. Anyway, it was nice being a White House aide and when I decided to marry Jean, then I had to submit my resignation and all the aides shipped in and gave me a great big silver bowl, which I still have. Uh, ice bucket and uh, stating I was an aide and that uh, I was leaving on that date and the reason for that was because I was married. All the aides at that time had to be single mainly because you were avail available then to take out and date the uh, uh, or go to these parties and meet other girls and it was a wonderful experience. Uh, but uh, now I think the age can be changed. At that time there were only 21 of us, seven from each service, Army, Navy, and Air Force. And the Marines were part of the Navy. Now they have many more aides, including the Coast Guard and all, and I'm not sure about the numbers, but at that time there were just 21 of us. So it was a nice contingent and uh, we did a lot to help uh, in their all their social functions, their parties, and uh, I was fortunate to be selected as This is a picture of my shadow box that I just picked up at MacDill Air Force Base at the Arts and Sciences group there where Hey, Mr. Ed Lowe made this box and installed all of this information in the box, which is a history of, or a partial history of what I did in the Air Force. It does not include all of the medals and ribbons, but it has the most important ones. As you can see down at the bottom, it says Jack Donald Kozer, Colonel, USAF retired. And this is a historical representation then of when I was in the Air Force. Starting at top right hand corner is my second lieutenant bars, which I got in February 7, 1941, when I graduated from Kelly Air Force Base 
in San Antonio, Texas. For a short time thereafter, I was stationed at Randolph Field as an instructor, and then a group of us were all transferred to San Angelo, Texas to a new field called Goodfellow, where they were going to train pilots, because during the, at that time there was a shortage of pilots and they needed a lot of instructors. I was there for about three and a half years and trained many flying cadets to be pilots. The ones that couldn't make it as a pilot washed out and became bombardiers, navigators, or something else that could be used in airplanes. Then I made second lieutenant in about a year and a half. I mean first lieutenant, and here's the picture here. And then later on through my career, I was advanced to captain and major and lieutenant colonel and finally colonel, at which was my rank when I retired in 1961. Shown in the next row are some of the wings. And here's the wings I got when I graduated from <coughs> flying school. Just a little simple wings as a pilot. And later on, after I had 1,500 hours, I became a senior pilot with a star on top of it. And later, when I got over 2,000 hours of flying time, I became a command pilot. Showed with the star with the wreath around it. This is a picture of the insignia that I wore as a flying cadet on my hat. Next over here is my missile badge when I was in research and development and designed the, helped design the Bullmark and the Falcon air-to-air -air missile. And that entitled me to this badge. U.S. we all wore on our uniform at that time. Here was my famous dog tags that we all wore around our neck and it had my name and serial number and address on it so that in case you were killed they would get your dog tags until find out where to send the body. Here was a accommodation medal. This one is with the two stars on it. It's when I was an aide to Major General Pete Casada and I was entitled to wear that particular emblem on my shirt to show that I was the aide of the general. The next one over here is a unit citation with oak leaf clusters and oak leaf clusters just mean that instead of having two medals you wear a oak leaf cluster for each additional medal that you had. In this case we got a couple of them and these, these the 6th bomb group got because of our bombing of or laying the depth charges in the Shimona Seiki Straits to immobilize the Japanese shipping. We did that in support of the Navy using our B-29s to fly at relatively low altitude dropping these depth charges which went to the bottom of the ocean then, or this, in this case it was the inland waterway and they were very exotic devices. Several times the airport or the ships could go over and they wouldn't detonate. And maybe on the third or fourth time they would detonate and blow them up. This is even when they had minesweepers coming by. They would ignore it once or twice and then bingo, blow up the ships. On the bottom row are some of the medals that I received. The most important one being on the left here, which is the Distinguished Flying Cross with oak leaf clusters. And I got those for several missions, one of which when I led a group of B-29s over a target and we knocked it out completely even though there was intense fire and anti-aircraft fire and uh, 
uh, enemy aircraft and as a result the whole crew got the distinguished flying cross on that one also another one when we had one engine shot out over Japan where we had to feather it and then coming back we had to feather another one both on the same side which is very unusual and it was very difficult to fly that B big B-29 back with only two engines running on one side and we had to drop down to about 500 feet we did that so that if we had to ditch or bail out we would be fairly close to the water and where the submarines were to pick us up we hoped fortunately we did not have to do that got back to base and landed with only two engines going the engineer did a great job of transferring fuel because the one side would get top heavy because we weren't using fuel out of there I actually used a lot of fuel because it wasn't very efficient to operate with only two engines running on one side and when I landed then we had another engine coughed out from fuel starvation so actually I taxied in with only one engine running the next medal is the air medal and we got one of those for every five missions we flew basically the rest of these are just here's a combination ribbon the green one that I got for various uh, things that I did in the Air Force the rest of these are all medals for uh, the Pacific or the region of which I was we were located or for the fact that uh, we were at a certain time during the war I have other ones that are not shown here but these are the most important ones and on each one of them it is inscribed as you can see what it was for I'm very happy to have this which I'll take home and hang on the wall and uh, to have a history of my operations in the Air Force. Okay, in conclusion, I would like to thank Carmini Dias and Bobby Kozer Jr. for putting together this magnificent uh, DVD, which I hope that all of my offspring and joy to the fullest. It's been a real pleasure to do it. Don't believe all of it, only most of it. Bye.